Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our webinar on creative approaches to nurse staffing challenges. Uh, next slide. We're really pleased this morning to have two exceptional speakers from two of our client facilities. Uh, Annette Greenwood from the Far West Division, Chief Nursing Officer for HCA Healthcare, and Pat Patton, the Interim System Chief Nursing Officer, Providence Swedish Medical Center, First Hill Campus. Now, Annette is in California right now, but as her role expands, she'll also be uh, in Nevada. Pat is currently in Seattle, Washington, and I myself am in Los Angeles uh, in California. Uh, welcome to our webinar today with Cope Health Solutions. I'm not going to spend any time talking about Cope Health Solutions, but I am going to ask if Alice would put our website on the chat so that if you folks would need or want any additional information, you can certainly access our website, which is copehealthsolutions.com. Rather easy to remember. I want to thank you for joining us. As um, we've worked with several hospitals across the country and throughout California, Hawaii, Oregon, Port, uh, Seattle, Washington, and uh, Spokane, Washington, Tacoma, Washington, we're finding that most of our client hospitals are basically telling us that their number one challenge right now is staffing issues. And this isn't an issue that's only relevant in hospitals. I think across the healthcare organizations, whether you're in a medical device uh, uh, organization or an FQHC or an urgent care facility or a doctor's office, I can tell you that all my colleagues that I interact with are stating that staffing is their number one issue. And I think a lot of this is reflective of what we as a country have gone through in the last several years through COVID. However, as we start to come out of it, I think all of us are struggling with what does our new model look like? What do our new structures look like? How do we work with this new generation of folks that maybe were educated their entire educational program through COVID, didn't really have a graduation, weren't necessarily socialized in the way that we would have expected. And so we do have many challenges outside of just finding enough individuals to staff our hospitals and healthcare entities. So I'm going to turn the time over now to Annette and Pat to introduce themselves and tell us a little bit about their organization, and then we'll get into some of the content that we'd like to talk about today. All right, well, I'll start it off. Uh, uh, Annette Greenwood, I am uh, currently the Division Chief Nurse Executive for Far West Division, which is located in Nevada. I just came out, Margaret, so I'm in an apartment out in Nevada now in, in uh, Henderson. Okay. Uh, but I spent the last eight and a half years as the chief nursing officer for Riverside Community Hospital, which is a 517 bed, uh, basically a tertiary care facility, uh, trauma level one, STEMI receiving uh, comprehensive stroke. And, um, and in that um, uh, time spent in Riverside, uh, I'll say also I've been in healthcare for a very long time. I will not tell you how long, uh, but a very long time. And all of that has been in the Southern California region, which is uh, incredibly complex and from a staffing standpoint, difficult. So I'll enjoy uh, getting to talk a little bit about Cope Health Scholars and how they've assisted and also um, some of our strategies for uh, recruitment and retention. Thank you. Thank you, Pat. Thank you, Anand. Pat? Yes, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Pat Patton. I am the current uh, Chief Nursing Officer for Swedish First Hill and the interim Chief Nursing Officer for um, uh, the Swedish system for uh, First Hill Ballard. Uh, Cherry Hill and Issaquah, as well as Redmond. Um, uh, we are the largest hospital system in the state of Washington. We do more births than anyone in the state of Washington here at First Hill um, in uh, that. And so we have a lot going on. And as Annette said, it's always a challenge to get specialty nurses and specialty personnel, um, let alone nurses, to come into our organization. And so the COPE Scholar Program has really um, been a great addition to our organization over the past several years and look forward to speaking to you more about that as we go forward in this hour. Thank you, Pat. I know that staffing certainly is being highlighted throughout the country in terms of an issue, but what else is happening in the healthcare systems that you're in that are just exacerbating the staffing issue also? Well, I'll and kick it off. Yeah, yeah. certainly. 
Try not to step on you, Pat, but <laughs> we'll see. Uh, I think Pat actually mentioned it. Uh, some of the complexity of the care that we're providing requires specialty training, specialty nurses, and that doesn't happen overnight. So recruitment um, into the ranks and then investment in the uh, competence of the individuals um, is, is really a challenge for us right now. And that's just because we don't have a lot of tenured individuals. There was a lot of loss during COVID. And so you're really growing a young group of, uh, of learners in all of our hospitals, I think, and particularly as you see, you know, night shifts, et cetera. So that's one of the things that challenges us on a daily basis, not just, I think, uh, again, Margaret, you mentioned it in the opening. It's not just personnel, it's the quality of that personnel that you're recruiting and then how you get them into the right specialty positions. Yeah, I, I would add to Annette's comments that, you know, one of the things, again, that we look at and, and struggle with is not just nursing personnel, right, but to look at um, respiratory and lab and radiology. Um, and when I'm short respiratory therapist, guess who has to pick up the ball, right? It's always nurses who have to pick up the ball um, and run with it because nurses can do everything, but a respiratory therapist can't do a nursing function, but nurses can give breathing treatments or um, MTIs and et cetera. And so again, how do we, again, promote not only the numbers, right, as Annette just said, but the quality of individuals um, and how do those people who are with us already, i.e. through the COPE Scholar Program, really learn that and see what goes on in our organization. And then we can really determine what is the quality? Where are they? Are they quality individuals and how do we grow them and help them even become part of our culture before they even graduate? I think California is one of a handful of states that also has mandated ratios, and that can always make the situation in a facility a little bit more difficult. And the flexibility isn't always there either to move folks around. Um, I think that both of your organizations have taken advantage of one of our programs that we offer at uh, Cope Health Solutions, and that's our Health Scholar Program. Uh, as Cope Health Solutions, we also have other programs like the Medical Assistant Program. We're working on a Certified Nursing Assistant Program. We have an Advanced Practitioner Fellowship, which is for nurse practitioners and PAs. However, all of these programs are done in partnership with either an individual hospital or with a hospital system. And both um, Providence as well as HCA have been our partners for many years. Now, the Health Scholar Program that you folks have implemented at your hospitals, how are they, How are these individuals different from the volunteer programs that you have? Yeah, so, uh, you know, um, as we uh, inter, have our COPE Scholars here, we see our really our volunteers and our COPE Scholars. Our COPE Scholars really help us do more things at the bedside than our volunteers do. Our volunteers are really not hands-on where our COPE Scholars are. Um, and we really take that seriously in helping them learn not only the skills that they've already been trained to do, i.e. vital signs and, you know, um, helping people get an extra sheet or an extra blanket or an extra pillow, but also talking to them in a way that's going to help increase our patient experience. And so we see that really as vital. Um, and we know that they're learners on top of that. And so in that learner um, phase, we're trying to give them as much learning opportunities as well as patient facing opportunities, whereas our volunteers are really helping us in a different way. They may have patient facing opportunities, but not as much as our COPE scholars. Um, and, and we love that. Um, we love having them there because we know that they're going to be able to be that extra set of hands um, for our nurses on the floor. Yeah, I, I totally agree with Pat. Uh, I've never called our COPE health scholars anything but that. Um, I really actually don't even consider them volunteers, if you will. I think they're two separate uh, categories. And the quality of the individual that we get through the COPE Health Scholar Program um, is, is um, head and above what we see in our volunteer program. And that's not to denigrate that program, but, but you're looking at folks that want a career in healthcare. You're looking at um, you know, college level, uh, university level performers, highly motivated, uh, some heading in a, in their uh, MD programs, some heading in nursing programs, some in imaging, you know, all over the board. And so these individuals have helped us in multiple multiple ways. Um, but I, I think it, back to Pat's point, it really at the bedside, you're looking for as much of support as you can 
for your licensed personnel, for your RNs. Uh, they have an incredible job to do and a lot of complexity. And the scholars can help with um, uh, those tasks. They can help with that burden. And so our nurses see them as, you know, a great, great asset. And uh, we've had, you know, different events in which they have jumped in and helped as well. And so I have nothing but great things to say, but that is like another level of personnel that we're able to provide to our nursing staff to help them on the units on a daily basis. And so a really highly thought of uh, and and kind of sought after, the, they kind of fight over them on the different units. <laughs> Well, until recently, I was a hospital CEO, and I happened to bring the Copal Scholar Program to the hospital that I was in. And it, it was at a time when we had just gone through, you know, redesign or re reduction, whatever, you know, you want to call it at your facility. And the, the staff I know saw the Copal Scholar Program as just a gift to them. And um, it was definitely an extra pair of hands, but it was also, as you mentioned, Annette and Pat, these are eager individuals that are wanting to learn and really soak up any kind of experience that uh, is going on in the unit. Yeah. So now I know that when you bring a program into a hospital, uh, there is there are some areas that love them that are just excited about having them others that are a little bit more resistant what has been your experience and how have you overcome some of that yeah one of the things um and, and sometimes it's it's not only the unit but it's the individual that shows up um uh, and what we found is that we have certain people who are there just like they love our COPE scholars and they love them and they were like uh, Pat, when are they coming back? When are the next group coming? Or they'll say, don't ever take this program away um, to that point. And then we have on the other side of the coin, though, we'll have an individual who will show up and they're just not the right fit. They're either don't have the right motivation or they don't have the right fit with the team um, that is there. Um, uh, and so, again, we work with the COPE program to say, OK, they may not just be right for this unit, but they may be right for a different unit. Um, in that space. Um, and so we do that. The, the great thing I think, though, about the, the COPE Health Scholar Program, Margaret, is that whenever we have um, the coordinator on site, they really try to match them with the right department so that they become a fit right away versus trying to, to make them fit, right? Um, to do that, understanding what is that unit about? What are you gonna be doing? What are you gonna be seeing every day? Um, and I can tell you, I, I just spoke to my labor and delivery di director yesterday and every one of the COPE scholars they've got, they absolutely love, the nurses love them, the physicians love them. And so they're they're eager to be there because they've really said, this is where I want to be. This is what I want to see. This is what I want to do. Um, and it has really worked. And so they're the people who have done it. There are other units like, why are they here? You know, why are they doing these things? And I think it's that part of how do you really integrate them in a way that's going to um, be seen as helpful. So. You're right, Marguerite, it's not always a marriage made in heaven in every unit, um, but the majority of the time, um, it, it's it's a great fit. Yeah, and I think at, at our facility, we've had COPE Health Scholars for a very long time. And so some of it is the maturity of the, um, the hospital in the utilization of COPE Health Scholars. Are they familiar with them? Do they understand what the mission is really in terms of their use, how we're, uh, where they come from and what they're looking to learn from us? So being an academic institution, and I almost think every hospital is now, you know, there's not really any hospitals that aren't providing some sort of clinical rotation, uh, but we embrace learning and we see them as learners. We also view them as the next potential uh, employee. So, uh, you know, we've had a lot of uh, return on investment over the years through with nursing and uh, even our MDs coming back from uh, a few of them finishing school and coming back and working in our facility that were previous uh, uh, health scholars. So that's kind of cool as well. Um, but I think it's maturity. And so now people across the hospital understand what the COPE Health Scholar Program brings to the table. And they are uh, looking in creative ways to use them. So none of them go, like they don't have a, a slow day when they hit the hospital. We are using them from the time they hit, you know, to the time that they leave. And I really haven't had, uh, to Pat's point, really haven't had mus much in the way of misses. We, we kind of have them rotate through different uh, clinical scenarios so that they, uh, units, et cetera, so that they can learn. Uh, and again, our managers and, and staff are 
looking out for those that um, potentially are trying to get into nursing school. I've had them sort of mother, you know, if you will, uh, the Cope Health Scholars, because they say, hey, I want to be a nurse. And the next thing you know, all the nurses on that unit are invested in them completing their education. Um, so uh, not a lot of misses. Um, in general, you guys always weed that out almost at the beginning. So um, yeah. I love also that it's uh, in a way kind of plug and play. I, I don't have to do a lot with onboarding. Um, I can bring these extra personnel that they run around in uh, khakis and a blue shirt and everybody knows them and everybody wants them on the units, extra hands every day, helping guide our uh, pa uh, patient experience as well, because it's a warm, uh, you know, a warm welcome from an, a different individual that has a little bit more time to spend even, you know, chatting with uh, patients that want to visit for a while at the bedside, those kinds of things. So, right. um, so pretty, pretty much been very good overall. Um, and, and adding additional hands to the to the complement of workers. Yeah, the... to to add to to Annette's story, you know, um, you, you um, triggered a memory. I was um, rounding, and um, we were talking to the Cope Scholars uh, about a month ago, and one of them said, you know, um, Pat, when I got here, you know, I was loving the ICU, and I knew I was going to be a physician, and I was going, getting ready to go to medical school, take all my prereqs, and as I got into this, and I saw what everybody did. I figured out in my life that's not what I wanted to do. I didn't want to go to medical school. I loved what nurses did. I loved how they touched the patient. I loved how they were with the patient. And that was my passion and what I wanted to do. And I saw that. And it was through this program that helped me really adjust my career in a way that's going to be beneficial to me versus what I thought I was going to do. Um, so again, I hear those. I heard one story, right, to do that. But I'm sure there are many, many of those stories out there. Um, to do that, but it was really heartwarming that this program really helped. So this individual didn't go down a path maybe that wasn't for that individual, but really then steered them in a way that was their passion, which is what we all want to do, right? We want to come to work and do our passion, right? What do we want to do? We don't want to just show up and, and punch a, a time clock. We want to come and really be passionate about what we do. So it was great to hear that story. I think what we some of what we've also heard is that, you know, I love the program. It was great but I've realized that healthcare isn't for me. And so they were able to identify that before they spent, you know, thousands of dollars, you know, going to school and then realizing a year or two down the road that, you know, this really wasn't their passion in life. Um, so it is a good experience for them. One of the things I wanted to add is that a lot of our client hospitals will have these health scholars throughout the organization, the emergency department. Um, Pat, I think you mentioned uh, maternal child, uh, the operating room. And you wouldn't think about putting, you know, a, an unlicensed person in some of these areas, but they actually are a helpful hand to the staff there. And they absolutely love having them. Uh, the other track that we can also do, which uh, we do in both your facilities, is have them in other parts of the hospital, such as some of the ancillary departments like radiology or even nursing admin or the quality department. So these are some other ideas. And so we will identify some of this as a admin track or a clinical track. And the majority of our students are in the clinical track because that's really what they're wanting to see. But we do have a, a few students that will try to select other things. Um, sometimes it's after they've decided this isn't really for them, but maybe the admin track or the IT department is really what they're looking for. Now, do both of you have unions and has that been an issue? Yes, <laughs> yeah. So uh, I've always worked in union facilities, so that's not new to me. But yes, we have a, a union um, for all of our uh, personnel pretty much at the hospital. Uh, two different unions. So uh, it hasn't really been an issue. Um, we have to be very careful about, you know, the roles that we all play the appropriate role and that we all uh, are taking care of the appropriate body of work, but never have had any complaints or grievances associated with utilization of uh, both the uh, health, health scholars or volunteers. So, um, you know, I think it's, I think the staff, they don't see it as someone, um, you know, trying to impinge on their work. They just see it as help. And, uh, you know, sure enough, we need an, as much help as we can get out on the units with the heavy burden of the high acuity patients that are out there and the, the cares that need to be rendered. So, um, yeah, no problems with that at all. Yep. Okay. I agree with the net. We, we have um, heavily unionized uh, system here at Providence Swedish, um, but we have never seen an issue or heard of an issue 
with the unions like raising a red flag or pushing back whenever our Copal scholars are on the floors or on the units like and that said they're always welcome to have the extra help um, and so they they welcome them with open arms so that's a great thing okay um, Alice can you put the slide on that shows um, very briefly I want to show the audience the role of the health scholar and the some of the programs that we work with also have junior health scholars and it differs slightly but not necessarily in a big way This may be hard for you to take a look at, but what we can do is we can make sure that for those of you that registered, that we'll send this out to you. We have junior health scholars that are 16 to 17 year olds. We have health scholars that are 18 plus. And one of the things I wanted to mention is also that we do have individuals that are second careers. They may you know, have been in another career, decided that it, this isn't for them, and they wanna see if healthcare is going to be something that they're interested in. So we do offer and get um, health scholars that are trying healthcare out to see if this is for them. The patient experience ambassadors are also health scholars, but their role is very specific. Um, they focus on mobility. Sometimes it's just on rounding uh, or call lights or some of the other metrics that we have. We do have one other category and those are care navigators. And we have the, that program in, in a few of our hospitals. And these individuals aren't licensed and so their role is to make phone calls get appointments for doctor's offices upon discharge making sure that they got to the pharmacy if they need transportation they help with that so that is also another type of um, individual or program that we have that that is under the umbrella of health scholars so um annette and pat you know we do have we try to make sure that we focus on some value metrics that the hospital is dealing with and are there any in either one of your facilities that you'd want to highlight that the scholars are working on or special projects well i'll, I'll highlight one that we used uh, we were having problems with the uh, nurses being consistent with the use of guardrails in our labor and delivery department um, Alaris pumps is what we use for IV and we have guardrails built in and uh, they were just not um, using the appropriate uh, pathway. And so we trained a couple of health scholars to do auditing and support and um, uh, got our practice to be over 95% compliant uh, with the assistance of those health, health scholars. It's more of a highlight, but it was a quality project through our, uh, with pharmacy and our quality department. Uh, you know, and uh, when you look at it as well, uh, um, you know, creating safety for our patients. So they were a great, great asset. And it's, it was actually, I was kind of concerned because it's, you know, going in and assessing whether the guardrails are set appropriately and then having conversations with licensed personnel or the leaders on the unit. And, uh, you know, they just took it, uh, we picked the right people, uh, trained them and then um, made a huge difference for us. It was an area where we didn't have the manpower at the time to invest in the auditing that needed to occur. And we needed some real time, um, you know, uh, advocates for this, the use of the guardrail. So that's just one example, but we've had multiple, multiple quality projects that we've worked on with health scholars. Um, you mentioned the patient experience ambassadors. We have those on several units trying to help us with our overall um, uh, engagement score or uh, patient experience scores, care experience scores. Uh, so really nothing's off the table. We, if we have a need and, uh, you know, we think that they'll be helpful with that. We've had them work in our HR department. We've had them work um, in various departments, employee health as well, uh, working through some of the imaging, et cetera, all on projects, some of it uh, throughput work as well. So there's been a lot of, uh, I would call it not the normal path type of work, but we see them as a, a, a good ad addition. And I do want to go back to, you know, we're talking really about sort of recruitment, retention, how do we engage our staff? This is a pipeline. So everything that we do now is about the the, the build of a pipeline of, of um, candidates for potential employment. Now the pipelines have to start earlier and earlier. So we need to be touching people um, before they get into college. We need to be touching them during uh, and, and building out um, kind of our uh, story around the facility and then they look at us, uh, we should be recruiting them while they're a COPE scholar uh, to come work for us and then helping them into 
the college program of their choice, the university of their choice, to try and uh, learn the skills that they need to come back and then be an, a, a staff member, a licensed staff member of ours. Yeah, I, could, I couldn't agree with that more. We try to in, in, include them in, in many different areas of the organization. Again, A, not only so that they get the um, experience, but it's always great to hear a fresh voice um, in different projects that you're doing. Because a lot of times, many of us have been in healthcare for several years and we're not seeing it because we have our blinders on. They're brand new to healthcare. So they're seeing things in a whole different way to do that. Um, I think, you know, to Annette's point, we're using our patient experience ambassadors to try to increase the number of surveys that we're getting completed. So actually going in there and really encouraging our patients, you know, we really want to hear from you. We really want to hear from when you go home, you'll be getting a survey. Please fill that out because we want to know how we've done. Um, is there anything else that we could do for you today? And they've really helped us um, in that space. On one of our units, we've set up a, a QR code. So they're going in there very early in the patient's stay. And so if a patient has an issue right then, they can scan the QR code, go in there, type in the, what their issue is. It goes straight to the manager and the manager can respond uh, um, very timely to that issue. So they're really getting ahead of the game and having our um, uh, patient experience ambassadors help us do that and implement that. We're gonna see if that works. And if that works, we're gonna then roll it out house-wide and, and possibly system-wide in order for us to do, because again, how do we do that? And, and it's through the help of the um, health um, ambassador, the patient experience ambassadors that we're getting that done. Thank you. We often will work with the hospital closely to make sure that whatever project is being done is in alliance with what is of importance to the organization. In some places, we'll do the hand washing audits for LeapFrog, or it could even be responding to call lights uh, for the HCAPS responsiveness score and so on. Those are just some additional examples um, that, that uh, our scholars are working on. Uh, how do these? How does the scholar program fit into your general philosophy of the hospital and impact you want to make in the community? Well, you know, we always see this. You know, is really this is one of the strong parts of our community benefit program um, to do that, um, and, and it, for several reasons, right? To to Annette's point earlier, yes, this is a pipeline, right? We want to make sure we have a pipeline of students that are coming through our organization, a so that. To your point earlier, Margaret, is healthcare even right for them, number one? But number two, are they going into the right profession that they've chosen? Um, and most of them are, which is great, right, to that. But also, we know that in the community, if we don't support that as an organization, what is the community going to do? And where are these people going to get those experiences? They have to have volunteer hours somewhere in order to get, for example, into medical school. But why not have them in an organization that's really going to show them what they're actually going to get into? versus volunteering someplace else. And I'm not trying to say that the hospital is the end all be all, right? But there are many, many different things that happen inside a hospital and we can then put them in our clinics or put them in our outlying facilities that are going to see things differently, right? Than just say a major medical center, for example, here downtown in Seattle, um, they can see what happens in rural Washington, et cetera. So we really take that seriously to say, how are we then paying it forward because we know, for example, I'm going to retire in the next 10, 12 years. I've got to have somebody behind me because if I don't, you know, what's going to happen? Um, mm -hmm. So looking at how that benefits not only the community, but but our but our uh, patient population throughout um, all of, again, the greater Seattle area here. Yeah, and I think uh, uh, in the in the local Riverside area where my uh, previous hospital was at, it's an underserved area, even though there's um, uh, a large amount of, of um, people moving into the area, there isn't the same commiserate uh, level of providers that are in the area, specialists that are in the area. Um, you know, it's not exactly a highly sought after area if you're, cl you're close to San Diego, close to Orange County. And so, you know, we have an obligation to the community to try to um, build out a program and, and work with the local universities and uh, the Cope Health Scholars and and all of our programs to make sure that we have people that are being developed that are more likely to stay in that particular region. And so uh, I really feel like uh, to, to Pat's point, it's, it's the legacy. I, I mean, I hope the legacy that we leave is that we provide as much it, uh, information, um, encouragement, passion for what we do to the next generation and invest in them. 
um, you know, it's our job to try to uh, help them to see what is beautiful about being a healthcare provider, a, a nurse, a physician, an imaging specialist, um, a technician, uh, cath lab technicians are in short order, you know, we need them. So I, I feel like it's a, our job to impart that passion and to try to provide guidance to the next generation. This is one way we could do that, uh, leaning in again to these individuals that are volunteering their time with us, uh, but they have an interest in healthcare in some respect. And I love the, the idea that, you know, the more exposure they have, the better vantage point they will have about what healthcare is and they will see the full compendium. And again, it doesn't really matter where they end up in terms of the compendium of healthcare, but, you know, I look at them as my potential employees and how am I going to grow them up so that they're going to be great nurses, great physicians, and that they understand that, you know, our mission is so important. What we do really matters. And, um, and that's what we try to impart to them while they spend their time with us. The, the Cope Health Scholars Program has approximately 35,000 plus alumni that are across the country. And I know that both of you have physicians and nurses that have been Cope Health Scholars at your hospital. And one of the things that students will always say when we see them as alumni is, I had such a great experience at um, Riverside Community Hospital or Providence Swedish. And I knew that this is where I wanted to come back and work. And it's always heartwarming when we hear something like that, because it tells us that we provided an experience in conjunction with the partner hospital that was really valuable to that community, because it certainly raises the economic um, value of that community when you have well-educated people that are working, paying taxes and so on. So it, it does make a difference in the community. Now, I know that many hospitals, I mean, we've recently gone through the pandemic and different hospitals dealt with it differently. Many said, no, we don't want anybody there that are students. Others actually utilize the students, especially in the ED where you had to have tents outside and so on. Are there other times when you've had to pull the health scholars to utilize them either for things that were just of value and importance to the hospital or things that didn't go well? Well, I can tell you, we, we have an older section of the vil building that I call Vintage. It's our Vintage building. <laughs> um, and and uh, we had a, a, a huge pipe burst and we call it the Great Flood, you know, but um, we utilize all the, we ask for all the Cope Health Scholars in-house to report to a certain location and then distributed them to help us evacuate one of the units. Um, and uh, you know, direct traffic and do a lot of different tasks. They were amazing. They were fun. They were, you know, engaged in it. They were kind of excited about the whole thing. Uh, but, but man, having that extra manpower that was in-house ready to go, um, that could be redistributed to help us during that difficult period was, was amazing. They did help during COVID as well. And, um, you know, just in general, if we have events, they're, they're kind of, uh, you know, the Johnny on the spot type of folks that we can use to help uh, just navigate the logistics of those circumstances. So they've been great. Good, good. It, it, it's funny that uh, Matt mentioned the flood because again, that's where, again, I've only been here for 11 months, but um, in my first few months, um, uh, Seattle had an unseasonably um, cold snap where it got down to 20 degrees and it really took, um, and it froze our firehead sprinklers and it burst on in, in up in our uh, maintenance building. And then that was on the 15th floor and then it flooded down um, to the 12th, 11th, 10th floor. And so we had to like pull everybody together to make things that we had to actually evacuate one floor over to another floor because it got flooded so bad. And we used our um, Hope Health Scholars really to come in and help. And it was literally all hands on deck uh, in order to do that. And they really got to see an emergency or things that were happening that was a not normal operations that I think was eye opening for them because they could see that, yes, we do have plans in place. Yes, you have to pivot when things happen. What do you do to do that? And so they had to not only the COPE scholars that were on that floor had to get used to now a new floor. They had to figure out how different ways of doing things because that floor was completely differently set up than the other floor. Right. And a lot of times you go in and you get used to doing things a certain way and then you get discombobulated. So I think it helped show them what they had to do um, differently in that space. So um, a very different, very different environment for them, but I think a great learning opportunity. 
We often find even in uh, hospitals that have community events that if you're going to have somebody there, they have to be paid personnel or volunteers. And so often our, our COPE scholars are called to support and help there. And um, they do enjoy it because it's something a little bit different, but they also see a different aspect of the of the hospital. You know, everybody thinks of the hospital as sick people or somebody where, you know, a place where somebody passes away. Um, but when they see some of these other activities that hospitals are in, they begin to realize that it's a real living organization that, you know, is doing a lot more for the community. So I, I think they do get a really well-rounded experience. Now, if somebody on the call is interested in the program, how would they go about managing that within their organization? Well, I do. You know, one of the things that, like, um, as the the chief nurse, you know, I see the value add, and so, you know, um, I involve my COO and CEO um, to do that to make sure that they a they're on board. I'll get the CFO involved in a little bit, but. I want to make sure the COO and the CEO really see the value add as well, um, because it's not only going to go into the nursing departments, as we've been talking about during this webinar, it's really in other departments, right? Like imaging and HR and other places. So we have to make sure that those in the operational spaces are on board as well um, to do that and really then show what the ROI is going to be, because if we don't, um, it's going to be hard to bring them in. And we've been able to do that, and it's been um, very value add for us um, uh, to do that. So it has been easy. Uh, my COO and I probably talk about this once a month um, just to continue to continue to have the conversations, right? Um, and to keep our CEO up to date about what the value is and where we're going with the program. But I think it's that constant conversation that you have to have to make sure because if the CEO is not on board, you're probably not going anywhere, but you have to really talk to them and tell them the why, um, why this is so important. Yeah, I think it's a it's a interesting conversation because it's an, a unique program. And uh, one of the things that I work really hard to do is make sure that the rest of the C-suite understands what the program provides. What are these folks doing? How are they um, helping us? And then also, uh, they don't necessarily understand that, for instance, at Riverside, we have, we try to average somewhere between 30 and 40 FTEs of Health Scholar. Now, so, and I can tell you that uh, without going into the contract detail, that the cost of those 40 FTEs is nowhere near what it would cost uh, us to employ those individuals. So you get a benefit immediately from, from sharing those statistics. I'm able to provide this uh, co uh, composite of individuals to go help on all different areas uh, for this amount and I'm getting this return. This return is much greater than what I'm putting out in terms of the cost of managing the program uh, through um, Cope Health Scholar. So, you know, that's a pretty easy statistic to be able to share with your CFO. For this, I get this, and this is how they help us. Um, and you can even show in some of the, we were talking about projects earlier, you could even show some of the improvements in the patient experience scores on the particular units that they have participated in, in frequent rounding and uh, making sure that the email's right so that we send out the, the, you know, the survey to the right person, those kinds of things. So uh, it, it's explaining the program how, in a way that your C-suite can understand. And then it's also sharing, here's what we get. And COPE always gives us a, a, a readout, you know, gives us data uh, where we're able to share what was the, what was the actual complement of individuals that we had? How many did we have? And for what period of time? So it's a pretty easy sell once you get to that point. Um, I see the value, obviously, you know, as a caregiver, I see it in a different way than maybe a finance guy would or even the CEO would. But um, I think it's uh, from an ROI perspective, uh, what, what we pay for the services of onboarding and managing these individuals is much less than what it would cost us to, to try to um, staff that. Uh, Annette and Pat, I appreciate all the feedback you've given us, and, and I think we'll open this up for questions. Um, but we do have a few questions that were sent in ahead of time, and I'm going to start with one while those of you on the call are thinking of some other things that you may want to ask both of them. You can also put it in the chat. Now, the first question I have is, what has your experience been recruiting internationally educated nurses, and have you found success doing it? And if you haven't, what have been some of the issues? 
So uh, it, recruiting like international that. nurses? International. It, yeah. So, the, you know, the thing is, um, it's not hard recruiting them. We have been successful in recruiting them. The hard part is the time that it takes and the process that it takes to get them here. So once you start recruiting them, it takes about two years to get them actually on site um, in that space. The other part that we're finding is that we're getting our international nurses here and they're absolutely awesome. They're wonderful. They're very skilled, very good at what they do. And then the U.S. government is having a hard time re-engaging or re-initializing their visa for them to stay in the country so that they can continue to practice. That's the challenge we're facing right now with international recruitment. Um, and so we're trying to get past those barriers and working strongly with our HR department as well as our government affairs uh, department to really figure out how do we mitigate those issues. Yeah, I, I, we don't have a, a large complement. During COVID, of course, as everybody else did, we looked at all of our options for recruitment. International was uh, a part of that. And the length of time uh, to be able to actually get them on site was a little prohibitive. Uh, we just have, I think, three total in, in our facility. But um, back to uh, Pat was right. The skill, um, I think you have to, depends on where you recruit from um, internationally. So you do have to be careful about uh, the background education, but most most areas that we recruited from highly skilled individuals that are very talented, no problems in regards to that. And um, uh, but it, it I think the the amount of work that is required to uh, get them there and then you know potentially to keep them there is difficult at this point. Not that I would um, exclude it because I think they're talented, but I think it's a, it definitely takes a lot of work and a lot of manpower. We've been able to recruit and um, reduce our turnover significantly, so we're not looking in that arena at this time. I've um, personally recruited from Canada, from England, um, India, the Philippines, and China. And part of what you have to overcome is the the socialization that our nurses have in this country. And when they go through a program of either a co-op program or a, a co-pal scholars program like ours, they begin to understand how we work as a team and how we interact with physicians, how we interact with each other as nurses, or how we interact with our CNA and support staff and our ancillary staff. So I think there's a little bit of education that needs to occur with socialization. I also have found that the nurses that came from England were probably some of the best, and obviously Canada is more like us, so it wasn't quite an issue. But what they do in England is they bring nurses from around the world, but they put them through a three-month immersion program, and it's an enormous amount of didactic and clinical work. So these individuals are really socialized into their way of working within the NHS. So it's a little bit different um, in each country based on where you're going to recruit from. Yeah, I would say also, Margaret, just that our, they, most of them have um, somewhere they want to be because they have a, a, a group, either family or a group of folks that might be in that particular area that have already settled, so to speak. And right. so that is important as well. Uh, having a community that they can come into that will support them through the transition is really important in the United States. 100%. Yeah. Now, somebody asked a question on what opportunities are out there for supporting healthcare organizational hiring. One of the things that we have found with our Health Scholar program, the students are, they really want to get into these hospitals because they're finding that it isn't easy. And so when they are practicing as a COPE Health Scholar, they're also networking with the staff there. And as you said earlier, Annette, when, once the staff know that they want to be a nurse, there's like a, um, there's like a mothering that takes over, you know, of guiding and mentoring these individuals. And that's how we find that many come back. The other benefit in both your organizations is the fact that we do have folks that do get hired into entry level positions, whether it's a CNA or whether it's a monitor tech or a messenger or even a diet clerk. They get their foot in the door in the hospital, love the experience and say, this is where I want to be when I come back, when I graduate. So it's a wonderful way to recruit. The return with these students isn't necessarily right away unless they're picking up an entry level position. But you do find that the word of mouth of the great experience they have at your hospital makes a huge difference with the peers that are graduating and ready to get out. 
Um, the other thing that's happening in a lot of facilities, and you may be doing this, um, is having nurse residency programs where you bring in a new grad and basically educate them to what you want them to be. Um, I don't know if either one of you are doing that, but you may want to share that or other creative strategies for staffing concerns you have. Yeah, we're uh, a couple of things. One, um, we do have an accredited nurse residency program for new nurse graduates when they come out. Um, and we always continue to hear that that's one of the reasons why people come to Swedish is because we, they know we have that and they continue to hear from their colleagues. You've got to go to some place that has to that has a re nurse residency program. So that's number one. Number two, we're, we're actually um, partnering with um, a local university that actually is right across the street from one of our hospitals. And we're actually hiring 16 um, uh, nursing students in their last year of nursing school. And they're actually coming in and in the state of Washington allows them to become what we call nurse techs and they can do nursing functions as long as they've been learned. They've learned them in school and have been checked off of them clinically um, and could do those types of things. So we um, bring them in, hire them as that, pay them, um, uh, of course, a non nursing wage, but pay them um, while they're doing it. And we've been finding that uh, it, right now, I think it's about 85, 86 percent that, uh, that we're retaining out of that program to stay in there. Many people want to either go back to where their home is in another state or want to go to another hospital that they always wanted to go to, but they're going to take on, um, a help of that program. But we found it very helpful because it also helps us then do a year's worth of interviewing for that person to see if we actually want to have them stay in that unit um, versus you know hiring a new grad fresh out of school that we really don't know. Yeah, so, so similar uh, pathway. We we do have nurse externs. Um, and that's actually hired after your, we'll hire you after your first semester of nursing school. Um, and then you come in and do uh, again to the level of training that you have in your program. So it kind of graduates. Um, so uh, we also have nurse residency pretty much across the hospital and all the different levels of care. Um, and that is a very robust program, very well sought after. Um, and I tell everybody that I know that's going into nursing, they need to find a hospital that has a residency. So I would agree 100%. It's a really nice transition into practice. The other things that we're doing is um, I've seen a lot of our um, scholars hired in as um, like transport. And um, so, you know, we actually had a have a, a couple of resignations the other day and I'm like, why are they resigning, you know? And uh, well, they got into medical school, you know, so, so uh, the, you know, great pipeline again for uh, program growth and for experience. And boy, you do transport for a while and you really do get to know the hospital really well. Yeah. Um, and I would also say, you know, going back to sort of the pipeline idea is that um, we are looking at for unique ways to vet uh, future employees. And, um, and, and Pat talked about, you know, you've got, you've got them there uh, in the COPE Scholar Program. You can see how they work, how they interact, what their communication skills are. And so, uh, you know, if I've got somebody that I've been familiar with, yeah, I'm going to get them in the door faster than someone I have no, even if they interview well, I, this person's got a foot in the door. And it helps us to, to create a quality level of personnel that we're recruiting because they've already been vetted. They already know the team. They already know where things are. Um, and they know that they like us and we like them. And so the managers are really, you know, they're, they're they've got their sort of, uh, they sort of tag certain scholars that they know are going to go through nursing program or through a different program to say, when you get when you get into school, I'm going to, you know, you're going to be mine. Come back as an extern. And so it's a really great pathway, a really great opportunity for us and for the scholars uh, to be able to, to check each other out, if you will. There's a question in the chat on whether there'd be more of an interest in recruiting internationally if you had a partner that would do all the administrative work and all the immigration work. Any thoughts on that? Well, we actually we actually partner with a, a, a mm -hmm. team that actually does exactly that, but it goes back to the same challenges that I had mentioned earlier. Um, you know, the time it takes them to get into the country, number one, and then number two, then uh, you know, keeping them in the country um, after their first visa expires is the challenge. So yes, it is easier to to use somebody else who does that. Um, they require a hefty fee, but you know, that fee, if you had to, back to Annette's point about hiring Pope scholars, if you had to hire and do all this work and have HR do the work, it's, you know, the cost is probably um, just as much, if not more. And yeah. I would say too, Margaret, you know, for the international recruits, um, it depends on your circumstance. 
<laughs> I have a waiting list now for positions uh, and I don't, I don't wait two years for a position to be filled. So I think it depends on your circumstance. If you're really in a tough market, a tough mm -hmm. area where you're having difficulty recruiting, then it makes sense to start investing in the pipeline of international nurses. Um, again, your, your product's going to be good once you get them there, but it's just right. what's your timeline and your headwind in terms of recruiting. And at, at this point, I don't need to do that because I have enough people in the pipeline to be able to fill the needs that I have. Yeah. I, I think from my experience, as I stated earlier, it's not necessarily um, the, if you have someone doing all the immigration work and you actually get them here, um, Pat mentioned some of the issues there. However, I would say, I would emphasize the socialization and the the manner in which you work within a team and how you interact with each other. I've always found that the international nurses are a little bit more timid with interacting with physicians and you just have to work through that and help them understand, you know, not to be scared, but that we're trying to work on behalf of the patient, you know? Yeah. So just a few things like that. I'd like to see, are there any other questions from the audience that's uh, on the call right now? If so, go ahead and raise your hand and then we can um, call on you. I think while folks are thinking, um, is there anything else that Annette or Pat you'd like to add in terms of where you find your biggest ROI? I think for us, you know, the biggest ROI for us is really looking um, at uh, to to Annette's point, I'm not going to be able to hire um, that much um, help to do things, especially when we're short and I have Pope scholars. You know, do, um, is it better to pay an agency per diem um, a person to come in and help, or um, the utilize the Pope scholars to the top of their ability and what they can do, right? Which helps tremendously. I think that's number one. Number two, we know that through value based purchasing, we're paid on patient experience scores. Um, and whether we meet those. And so by the use of our patient experience scholars and having them help us increase our scores through constant rounding, hourly rounding, and other items such as that, we know that we can um, improve in that space. So I think those two things um, uh, right away. I think the third thing for us um, is really utilizing our um, COPE scholars around our hand hygiene audits. We know you have to have 40 per unit um, per month to do that. Um, and they've been trained to look um, for hand hygiene. And so when we continue to receive a leapfrog scores, it only helps insurers um, um, better want to partner with us um, and give us better rates because we know we're providing quality care at our organization. So we utilize that and make sure that um, we're doing this. And I think those three, three things rise to the top for me. Yeah, I think I think you're right on the money, Pat. And then the only other thing I would say is just, um, you know, they're not they're not in my staffing grid. This is not. Yeah. This is not a replacement for the staffing grid. This is not changing the staffing grid. This is not changing the number of PCTs or CNAs that I have on the unit, secretaries that I have on the unit. This is all added. So it's all a plus. <laughs> There's never, it's never uh, like uh, I pull a PCT and put a health scholar. So it's a value add completely to, from the viewpoint of the staff member on the unit. This isn't, um, you know, a part, uh, a substitute for the staffing grid. So I want to make that clear. You know, we have a staffing grid. We always staff to that. Um, and ratios in California are, you know, uh, are important to us, making sure we have the right complement of CNAs on the unit, secretaries, and and even other ancillary support. Um, so, so this whole program really is something that is just an extra, if you will. Uh, to the from the vantage point of the RN or the PCT on the unit, they have a partner that can help them with a, a patient uh, uh, change or, or a bed change or those kinds of things, helping them to the restroom uh, so that um, you know they have an extra set of hands. And so that's the value add from the standpoint. If you were looking through your nurse's eyes or your PCT's eyes, they this is another helper that showed up today to help me with the uh, vast amount of duties that I have to uh, keep up with. So. Um, that is a different viewpoint than your your C-suite. Um, all of the things that Pat said are absolutely true, uh, but just think about it from the standpoint of an engaged workforce that believes that you care about them and that wants to be working at your facility. This is a way that you help support them on a daily basis. Thank you. 
Just a little bit about Cope Health Solutions. We are throughout a national company. Our corporate headquarters is here in LA as well as in New York City. And we have programs throughout the country. The Cope Health Scholar Program is here heavily in California. We have approximately 25 facilities that we work with in um, California, in Washington State, as well as uh, Hawaii and Oregon. Now, somebody in the chat asked whether we would partner in New York. Absolutely. As Annette had said earlier, it's kind of a plug and play for you as the organization. Uh, we do all of the advertising, the recruiting. We actually interview students. They have to write little essays in their application. Uh, we go through them, make sure that they're a good fit. We work with them on what they're looking for. We have a tier system of starting them out in a uh, tier one, which is usually med surge units, and then they progress on into the specialty units. Uh, the program itself is 30 hours of didactic and training and 250 hours to be able to graduate. And we do usually, we'll, we will partner with a university in that particular state to get them a certificate of completion so that they have something that they can show when they're going either to nursing school or even medical school. We do do recommendations of uh, letters of recommendation for these students. We often find that it this experience is a huge plus for students that are applying into medical school. Um, PA school requires 1,000 plus hours of community service. They'll often use this program in, in that manner. So there's multiple ways that the Copal Schoolers can not only support you while they're with you, but it certainly works in their favor to get the at most from your organization to be able to further their own personal journey. So any closing comments, Annette or Pat? Well, I um, I can't say how much I appreciate the opportunity to share with you today. Um, the COPE Health Solutions uh, product for our facility has been quite a benefit. And I, I see it as a part of a compendium of activities that we have to create pipelines mm -hmm. for uh, future employees. And so I would just say, yeah, I, uh, I absolutely have enjoyed working. The other thing I didn't share was actually working with you all on the master's level program as well. So we've had several um, master's level scholars that um, have done some of their practicums with us. And that, again, in the quality arena has been a real benefit. But it's a great program and happy uh, if anybody wanted to reach out to share any more details if, uh, about our experience. Sure. Thank you. Yeah, I would I would echo Annette's comments, but also say thank you know, again. Thanks for allowing us to come and tell tell you all about our programs at our hospitals and what we've been doing. Um, it has been really a value add for us at Swedish. I'm so glad to have the Cope Health Scholar programs. And again, you never know the difference you're going to make in a person's life until they come back around five, ten years later and said, "Remember when I was here and I was a Cope Health Scholar and blah blah blah." It, it just warms your heart because you know that you made a difference in their lives because they came back to tell you so. So it's always something that you're doing more for people than you really think you're doing. So don't forget that. Thank you, Pat. And I really appreciate both of you participating today in our webinar. For those of you that are on the call, we'll make sure that we send out the role of the health scholar so that you can take a look at that. Uh, you're certainly welcome to give us a call if you want more information. It sounds like both Annette and Pat are also open to having you reach out to them. Uh, if you're okay, we'll share your email addresses with them, Pat and Annette, or? Okay, um, we'll do that also so that you have that information. Thank you everyone for your time today. We really appreciate it. And uh, thank you again, Pat and Annette.